and now I'm going to click start webinar. Okay, that's great with people joining. So let's start. Hello from London. This is Shane McGlynn from IRM UK and welcome to this webinar on business transformation and Airbus with Luca De Risi from Mega International. We welcome your questions via the Q&A pane and we will try to answer as many questions as possible. Now over to you, Luca. Thank you, Shane. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, I would also like to extend a, a special welcome to our customers here. Uh, I can tell that there are at least five of our customers uh, in, the, in the attendees. So thank you very much for joining. Thank you to our partners also who joined and to everyone else. Um, of course, uh, many of you are in the uh, airspace industry. I can see at least 15 people. Um, I guess you want to hear about Airbus and I'll do my best to uh, relay uh, everything that happens there uh, very adequately. So my name is Luca De Risi. I'm Chief Operating Officer for Mega International. We are a uh, French software company based in Paris with offices really all around and partners also all over the world. Um, uh, what else? Uh, we do software, of course, for enterprise architecture and business transformation. And today I'd like to talk about the future-proof enterprise. And then I will illustrate what uh, our success story with Airbus uh, who has been with us with, for uh, over 20 years, actually. Okay, so uh, why the future-proof enterprise first? Well, quite obviously, because uh, everything changes, uh, they change very fast, and uh, the companies who want to adapt to change and stay competitive need to be able to plan, but also to react to change. But if I'm honest with you, the word digital transformation to me was really a marketing buzz until quite recently. Why? Because like many of you, I was born with change. You no, know, we were born with Wi-Fi, DVDs, smartphones, uh, e-commerce, e-banking, e-dating for those who use it. Um, so change really becomes the new normal. But then when you look at it from inside the company, it's, it's much different. So I can tell you what happened at Mega, for instance. Mega was a uh, on-prem software provider. And we shifted to a SaaS first software provider. And that's not just about rehosting the software on the cloud. Uh, it's a whole new way of managing the company and interacting with customers. So we had to set up a, uh, a customer uh, success uh, management team. Um, we had to, uh, you know, apart from all the technical things, you know, choosing the SaaS provider, cloud provider, is it the French one, the American one? Um, then it's a, a whole change in terms of customer journey and making sure that you know, we manage the customer experience in the best way. And that's the biggest change. Then if that happened to us, uh, we are a 350 people company. Imagine the difficulties for a companies of tens of thousands of people. So there are teams in the company that help on just that, coordinating everyone on transformation. And one of those teams is called enterprise architecture. And that's where we intervene. We support them with software and guidance to support transformation. Now, um, I know also before I go to the next slide that uh, there's a few attendees from the NHS. Uh, I want to say I have the utmost admiration for what you, for, for what you guys are doing. And the next example actually tells a, a story that you will be a, you will be uh, familiar with, as I read this article quite recently, um, that illustrates well the concept. Um, so apparently a few years back, uh, the NHS uh, tried to digitize patient records. And um, about 10 years later, an audit was done by the National Audit Office that said that it didn't exactly go through because it was seen more as a technology program than a business program. So. Um, apparently, based on this article, the customer needs were not um, analyzed enough in order to do the technology change. So this is the kind of things that we address. Uh, if you take a bit more distance, <clears throat> if you listen to McKinsey, 
McKinsey will say that uh, transformation often fails uh, because of incomplete information. So if you want transformation to succeed, you need to know your context and you need to make sure that you have visibility on the different uh, domains that will be affected by the transformation so that you can plan and execute on the, on the change. If you listen to Price, Price will say that it's all about the customer. A transformation program that succeeds is based on the customer in the center. Uh, and then if you listen to uh, Deloitte, uh, then they will say that you have to clearly express the strategy and align everyone. So it's really then about alignment. And of course, if I'm citing these, it's because we believe at MEGA that all three are equally important. Uh, successful change is based on the right visibility so you can plan, but also react to change. It's based on the customer, especially when you do a technology change. It's not just about technology, it's about the business. And you need to make sure everyone is aligned because transformation is a collective effort. So on this note, uh, I would like to ask a little question to uh, the audience and see if everyone is there. So Shane, can you please uh, launch the question? Don Ben, Don Luca. I can see it. I'm just waiting for everyone to vote. Okay, Shane, can you see any result yet? Yes, absolutely. Um, we have, let's see, 80% of the attendees have voted. Um, in silos, we have 10%. Somehow, collaboratively, we have 61%. And collaboratively, we have 29%. Thank you. That's very insightful. And that's also what we see uh, with our customers. And we work with mostly large companies like the, the, the likes of Airbus, uh, or of course a bit smaller. And uh, that's what we see, you know, there is a tendency towards federated uh, organizations and, and change management, but still over half of you said that it's partially um, collaborative. And that's where we need to work together. That's where we think that, and that's the next slide, the, the future proof enterprise is the enterprise that understands how everything connects because transformation doesn't work in silos. We believe that you know, today's companies where everything changes need to be agile and resilient. To be agile, you need to understand the impacts and dependencies of the things you want to change. If you want to introduce a new product, for instance, you need to understand uh, what the existing product or absence thereof is connected to, what will be the change on the customers, on the IT systems, on data, so everything connects. And that's the role of architects, and that's also how we support them, by providing them the right visibility on the ecosystem, uh, being customer oriented, because any change will impact the customer, and aligning the whole company on, uh, on the change and on the strategy. Everything connects. And now I'd like to give you three examples of use cases that you will very likely recognize and do involve that visibility and collaboration. If I take a cloud migration, for instance, when it comes to a cloud migration, uh, the first thing you need to do is know where you are because it's one thing to say, I want to migrate 93% of my software to the cloud, but uh, before that you need to know where you are so that you can go where you wanna go. So architects will help you discover what you have today, map your existing uh, landscape. They will understand impacts and dependencies in order to uh, avoid risks during the migration. Like for instance, if uh, your CRM you want to migrate to the cloud is connected to 15 other systems, well, you need to know that before it's too late and then you will, you, you, you will be delayed. Um, but it's also about the customer. A cloud migration is not just about rehosting or um, or refactoring the application on the cloud. It's also about understanding how the new system will, um, will be used by customers and how you need to work on, the, on this architecture to satisfy the customer. And then you may also involve new regulations, 
uh, data privacy, and more. So it's a collaborative effort, and you need to draw that journey to plan and, uh, and execute safely. A second use case is introducing new systems or new products. So typically, when, when, you, when you introduce a new product that could be um, a, a, new, um, a new application um, for your uh, customers, but also internally, um, it could be um, a new service, a new banking service, so new products and services. The first thing you need to do is understand how it fits the business, you know, which capabilities it's going to fulfill. Then you want to know how it's going to be implemented and how it's going to be used by customers, internal or external. For that, you need to understand how things work today without the service or the product and how they will work tomorrow. So you don't need to map the whole organization there, but you need to make sure you have the right visibility on what you want to change as is and to be. Then. Today, IT is the business. So if you introduce a new product, very likely you will introduce new software, at least new software features. And when doing so, you also want to reuse data. You don't want to replicate or you know, create du duplications for data. You need to understand what is the golden source of data and reuse it in your software. So again here, introducing new products is a big, big business change that requires this full visibility and coordination. And I'll take a third one. And this is more on the, on the topic of reacting and adapting to change. Because transformation is not just about planning. It's also about reacting and reacting with agility. And here I'll, uh, I'll quote one of our, or mention one of our customers, SBM Offshore. They are on the business process side. Uh, and they have done a whole quality management system where they map their key processes and provide the information on their SharePoint portal to all their employees. And thanks to that, uh, SBM Offshore does uh, offshore platforms for oil extraction. And thanks to uh, that portal, where they simply documented the processes, IT, and, and they can plan for change, uh, they're also able to react to, uh, to disruptions. So when they have an issue on a, on a platform, their response time has accelerated by uh, sevenfold. So that's how you know, three examples that show you how to plan and react to change with minimal documentation and um, an enterprise architect approach. Now, at Hopex, that's of course what we do. Uh, with EA, uh, we provide that visibility on strategy, processes, data, and technology. It's not just about technology. So you can see how things connect and support business transformation. And one last concept before we shift to Airbus. Um, in the past, we noticed at Mega that a lot of practitioners did architecture in an academic way. So, you know, it's all about the frameworks that you use. It's really the science of architecture. It's more about the what than the why you do architecture. And typically, in certain frameworks, you have to start with the strategy, then the processes, then IT, then data, then infrastructure, then projects. And by the time you get down to the infrastructure, your strategy has changed. So the approaches that are too much focused on documentation instead of business outcomes tend to fail. And that has affected the reputation of architecture, but it doesn't have to be this way. Uh, we prefer to focus on a business outcome driven approach. It's, it leverages automation so that you can discover everything you have so that you can focus on the strategy and the future state. It focuses on providing you smart insights and recommendations so you can focus on change itself. And it's not about boiling the ocean and doing everything at once. It's about selecting the right use cases that you need to do for a specific stakeholder in the organization and deliver outcomes specifically for them. So for instance, if you're going to work for your CIO, you may start with a rationalization exercise or technology obsolescence. If you work with uh, um, portfolio managers, you may work on cloud migration. Uh, but then if you work for um, compliance, then you can work on um, assessing your compliance of your software with regulations on a quarterly basis. And you cannot do everything at once. So really the use case approach is what we recommend when it comes to architecture. And that's also what gave birth to the concept of next gen EA. NextGen EA is a fast EA, uh, an EA that is recognized by the business and delivers value based on automation, 
so that you can discover everything you have instead of mapping everything manually because that doesn't work. So discover your applications on SaaS, but also on-prem because you cannot migrate to SaaS if you don't know what you have on-prem or cloud. Um, data discovery, so you can all understand the golden sources and the data line lineage. And of course, process mining, because it's not just about IT, it's also about the business. We connect all this, and then we help you transform with smart insights and use cases. Now, this leads directly to what Airbus did, because Airbus do have this collaborative and holistic view on transformation, which makes them successful. So we were uh, lucky enough to work with Airbus for over 20 years now, and they're I mean, I like to say still very happy to work with us. And this is a very strategic program that you can even find on their, uh, on the homepage of their website. It's called the DDMS program. DDMS stands for Digital Design um, Manufacturing. And I need to lower this for a second. Sorry for that. Manufacturing and Services. DDMS means that they implement a digital first approach to design the organization that will enable the plane, the digital plane of tomorrow. So it's, um, it, they started by designing the end-to-end -end manufacturing process from design all the way to services um, collaboratively in a view to reduce time to market. And then I'll tell you the results they obtained. And in order to align departments and standardize the way that people work together. So it's a very ambitious program. It's strategic. The CEO you know, is, uh, is following it carefully. And it's all about a 360 view on the business transformation. It's not just robotics. It's not just IT or systems. It's before all an objective of accelerating time to market. And it connects a business transformation with IT, data, and risk. So you need to start by understanding your capabilities, the processes that, that implement them, the systems that will automate the, these processes and, and operate those processes, and then of course the risk associated to them. In fact, at Airbus, over 10 different departments were involved and are still involved in the program. Uh, you can say uh, process owners, enterprise architects, security managers, designers, et cetera. And, um, and they work together on those four domains. Now, um, in practice, how does that work? First, it's about the business. It's a business change. It's not just IT. It's not just data. It's a business change. And to that view, it's based on business capabilities. Uh, business capabilities are a great way to describe what the organization does. And it's a great starting point for EA in general, because then you can connect everything else and align your changes on the business. So they started with the business capabilities and the description of the environment. And then they started describing if the capabilities do why you do things, they started then describing the processes, the key processes first. And the processes, of course, describe the how you will do things. So now if you want to change certain capabilities, is it uh, manufacturing? Is it procurement? Is it sales? Then you will describe as is to be processes for the specific capabilities that you want to change. So what they did at Airbus is the end-to-end -end process design because they really wanted to understand and transform the whole end-to-end -end process. And then comes the link with IT and data. IT because processes are systematically automated or operated with or by software or IT in general. And uh, a very interesting thing that, they, the thing that they did at Airbus is they implemented a service-oriented architecture. So you have to imagine it's, a, of course, a team of engineers. Um, it's a high technology. So the description have to be very precise and somehow sophisticated in that specific case. The service-oriented architecture allows you to focus on services instead of just your applications. Because an application catalog is basically what you already have in your CMD. Focusing on the services, then you focus on the business outcomes of your applications. And your services can stay. They can be reused. And if you decide to change the application behind the service, the service may stay the same. 
and then this leads to functionalities and to business capabilities. So when it comes to rationalizing your IT landscape and transforming your processes in IT, a service-oriented architecture, SOA, uh, will work well. And that's exactly what they, I think they pretty much pioneered this at Airbus. And then when it comes to the end-to-end -end process design, um, what they leverage is BPMN, and they are a huge user of the BPMN notation that they use to really standardize in a simple way and with uh, the same nomenclature, uh, the description and the way that everyone works. So it's business oriented, it leads to IT, but one of the key pieces at Airbus is the data domain. The data domain where Airbus documented three levels of data so that people could work together and understand each other. The conceptual view is where you define your concepts and key attributes. It's a simple view that speaks to the business. You know, is it your plane, your wing, your customer? In a way that the business understands it. That's what you share with the business. Then you can speak to the software developers and you'll do your entity relationship diagrams or your class diagrams and attributes. That's what is implemented in the software. It's say your meta model. That's the logical side. And then you have the technology side. And that's the databases. So today, you need to be able to manage both the structured data in database with the columns and the tables. You also need to be able to manage the unstructured data and discover that so that based on the discovery, you have both the top-down and the bottom-up approach to manage data in a centralized way that connects with your processes and with your applications. That's exactly their view. And of course, we're happy to support them because it has this holistic vision. And to finish with data, um, I found those screenshots quite, um, quite funny. In fact, I was able to, uh, to paste them here because you cannot read much. Um, and they called that the electrical wiring exercise. And that's where they connect the data that they have mapped at the three levels before with the processes and the systems. Electrical wiring is really the data lineage. Um, and this way you can have the full grasp of the data flows you can understand what are the golden sources of data. So what is the master uh, application or location for your data so that you don't duplicate it and you just reuse what already exists? How many times uh, do software developers redo something that already exists somewhere else? That's how you can rationalize. And the data lineage also helps you on the data quality to make sure that if you want to provide a specific report uh, at the end of the line, well, you have the whole lineage upstream and downstream to understand how the data was modified all along the stream of evolutions and make sure that the quality stays good at the end. And this applies to Airbus, but I see it apply a lot in financial domain um, in, in, and insurance in particular. And I'm almost done, Shane. This is the results. Um, Thanks to the program, Airbus plans to make a 30% uh, gain in uh, time to market. It's huge in the industry. They accelerate the timeline, they standardize the way people work, um, they ensure operational performance, but before all it's based on the customer because it's business transformation first that is supported by data and IT. I'll finish with this and I would just like to give a word about Mega. Um, Mega, well, we've been around for quite some time. It's been 30 years, but as you can see, we're uh, young and dynamic. Uh, we're leaders and we've been for years on several quadrants, including the Gartner for 12 years. And uh, we're actually very happy that customers um, gave, gave us the price of customer choice uh, and we're basically the only leaders to have that same price. I'll stop here um, and then I'm very happy to answer your questions. That is great. Thank you so much, Luca. We have a few questions. First question, please, is where do you recommend to start with EA programs? Ah, that's, uh, that's quite a common question, I must say, uh, when it comes to EA. Um, EA may seem like it's a lot of data, and in the end it is, but you need to make sure you focus on what you need to do for specific stakeholders. And if you don't have a specific use case in mind, uh, what we recommend is to start with what will provide the quickest value, things that you can do in an automated way. So typically uh, you will work on um, rational application rationalization. So analyze redundancy based on your delivered capabilities. 
um, obsolescence management. And then from there, you can, and those use cases you can do in a matter of weeks, really, with all the, the automation that we provide. Then based on that, you can grow into cloud migration support because you already have your, your baseline that you can use for that, IT compliance, support other people like the CISO, and then grow, of course, into the whole, into the whole scope step by step. Great, thank you. Another question, please. And uh, it is, what is the typical implementation time? So that's close to what I, uh, I said just before. It depends on the use case. So typically the first use cases, they will do very fast. It's a, it's a matter of weeks um, to set up the repository and populate the data so that you can do a, a rationalization use case. You know, you can start with the EA baseline in a matter of weeks and then complete your rationalization plan in a matter of a few months. Uh, then if you want to do a cloud migration, uh, the planning will be quick, but then of course the execution uh, depends on the number of applications and the size of the company. But what is important, I think, is that the, the baseline is what you can do in a matter of weeks, thanks to discovery and thanks to, uh, you know, to the point and use case based methodologies. Wonderful, thank you. Um, how would you approach an organization that doesn't understand or appreciate uh, EA and its benefits? Great. So now we need to talk about EA in general. So EA has different stakeholders. So you have to focus on who you're talking to. Are you talking to the CIO? Are you talking to uh, business managers? Are you talking to governance and compliance? You won't say exactly the same thing. In the end, I want to say that EA is the key to successful planning and strategy execution. It can be easier to start maybe at an IT level because very often enterprise architects work directly for the CIO. They're kind of the right arm to the CIO. And you can pitch use cases such as modernizing the IT landscape, migrating to the cloud, or, um, or digitizing processes. And those are things that usually will appeal to a CIO. And, uh, and from there, then you can bring it to a more connected um, vision. Great, great, thank you. Uh, which business roles benefited first or most um, at Airbus as a consequence of this EA application? So I want to say it's, um, it's, it, it's a company-wide program. It's on their website. It's, um, it's a strategic program with visibility at the C level. So today we're even expanding the user base and, uh, and we have several hundred users of the software. So um, I, I can only say, imagine that the, the stakeholders are pretty wide. In fact, they involve over 10 departments. Um, then to get more in depth into the specific stakeholders, apart from you know, C level and CIO level, um, well, I'm pretty sure, given the, the companies we have right now in the audience, we could organize some, uh, some reference calls. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, let's see, L lots of questions, but we're running out of time. Um, next Gen EA, uh, Luca, can you tell us some more about this, please? Next Gen EA, well, you know, first, I'm very happy to say that this year we're 30 and younger than ever. And NextGen EA represents NextGen Mega and NextGen EA. We have new offices, we have new buildings, new management team, and on the same time, a new product. And the V5 that's coming really soon really includes fantastic features of automation, smart insight, discovery. Um, and this is really what we call NextGen EA and Mega. Okay, great. Um, and we have uh, lots more questions, but maybe we can arrange for those to be answered offline, Luca. Absolutely, and I can stay a couple more minutes if you need. So, okay, I think we'd just like to thank everyone who joined uh, the webinar today, but in particular, big thanks to you, Luca. Thank you very much. My pleasure, and I'll be happy to answer those questions uh, by email. Wonderful, thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. Bye now.